I want to introduce to you the moderator of tonight's event. He's not only one of America's most influential men in the news business, but he has chosen to use his talents, to use his gift of writing and his organization influence for the kingdom. Please give a warm welcome and a round of applause for my good friend, this founder and CEO of WorldNet Daily, the largest independent news organization in the world, Joseph Farah. Thank you, thank you. Your words are too kind, Jim. Uh, you know, there are more than two billion people in the world who call themselves Christians. And almost all of them would express some kind of reverence for the Ten Commandments. Um, although, you know, an increasing number of them, especially here in the United States, say that as new creations in Christ, they're no longer capable of committing sin, so they, could, they shouldn't even have to worry about what the Ten Commandments are about. But most believers at least acknowledge that they're God's commandments, good guidelines for, for living, and most would say they try to live by them. Most would acknowledge when they fall short, they need repentance. But what about the fourth commandment? What about the Sabbath? Do they observe the Sabbath as defined in the Bible? Do they keep the seventh day holy? Or should they? And if so, why do so few of more than two billion believers in the world actually do so? This is the topic of a very unusual debate today here at Passion for Truth Ministries in St. Charles, Missouri, with two very passionate pastors and teachers, Jim Staley and Chris Rosebro. Before I introduce them formally tonight, let me introduce myself. My name is Joseph Farah of WND.com, formerly known as WorldNetDaily.com, the first independent news agency created for the internet some 17 years ago. That's a long time. 17 years in internet years is like a thousand. Uh, I'm a lifelong journalist and a follower of Jesus, Yeshua. WND.com also happens to be the largest Christian website in the world, uh, though our mission is primarily to bring the Christian worldview into the reporting of the news. So I will serve as the moderator of this debate tonight, though when it comes time to being a believer in Jesus. I am no moderate. In fact, I'm not really much of a moderate in anything, uh, but I am all in for Jesus Yeshua. And what that means for me, as I suspect it does for all of you here tonight and all of those watching online, is this question. What does Yeshua mean when he tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments? I came all the way from Washington, D.C. for this debate tonight because it's actually quite a historic event. You, know, you, you all know how you can find anything on YouTube, right? Just try to find a debate like this on YouTube. You won't find it. You'll find debates on every imaginable topic you can think of, but not on the Sabbath. So this is history in the making. The topic tonight, should Christians keep the Sabbath? So let's meet our debaters. Chris Rosebro is an apologist and pastor. He's a regular guest on the radio program, radio program Issues Etc. right here in KFUO in St. Louis. He's lectured at several conferences in the U.S. and has been featured with prominent Christian authors such as Phil Johnson and Dr. James White. Chris is captain of Pirate Christian Radio, host of the Fighting for the Faith radio program and pastor at Kongsv Kongsvinger Lutheran Church in Oslo, Minnesota. He's got a degree in religious studies and biblical languages. And I just met Chris today for the first time, though we have corresponded in the past. And I can tell you he's a very smart and very prepared for this challenge 
tonight representing the negative position on Sabbath keeping. And he will be debating Jim Staley, the director of Passion for Truth Ministries and pastor teacher of Passion for Truth Fellowship, our venue tonight. He's been featured on God's Learning Channel, Sky Angel Network, WND.com, Sid Roth's at Supernatural program, and many others. His teachings and messages are heard daily and weekly on radio stations around the country and are translated into multiple languages and broadcast into Christian television stations around the world. For years, Jim was an evangelical Christian apologist right here in the St. Louis area, teaching Bible study classes and equipping Christians to better defend their faith and to evangelize. But since 2001, he has dedicated his life to helping believers further understand the Christian roots of their faith by diving into the original cultural context, language, and idiomatic expressions of the Bible and how to apply them to their faith today. Now let's talk about the ground rules and format for this lively, friendly, brotherly, respectful showdown. Each debater, <laughs> each debater will be allowed an opening statement of 20 minutes on the topic. And those opening statements will be followed by 10 minutes of rebuttal time, followed by two more seven-minute rebuttals. Then we move on to two 10-minute cross-examination periods, and finally, two closing statements of just five minutes each. So, buckle your seatbelts. Settle down for what we anticipate to be history in the making, a very provocative and informative two-hour debate like you have never seen before. A few more ground rules before we get started. Please hold your applause until the end of each speaker's statement. Except me, of course. Applaud any time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please do not talk shout, cheer, or jeer while the debaters are making their presentations. Um, please turn your cell phones off now. Let me do that too. Um, no flash pictures, please. That can be distracting. If you've got young children still here, young children who, like me, have trouble sitting still for two hours, please take advantage of the children's ministries downstairs, and there's also a TV viewing room uh, area in the cry room upstairs, which is where the loser of this debate, I guess, goes. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that's outside the sanctuary. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Jim Staley and Chris Roseboro. Good luck, gentlemen. Now, Jim Staley, welcome to the podium for your 20-minute opening statement. First of all, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming today to witness this historic event on such a very important subject. I'm going to need the monitors turned down, please. I also want to thank my opponent, Chris Rosebro. Uh, for accepting the invitation to engage on this topic, as well as Joseph Ferrer for taking time out of his busy schedule to fly all the way out here from Washington, D.C. And, uh, and be here to moderate this debate. First of all, I want to mention that this is not a salvific issue. This is not a salvation issue. Uh, this is about uh, whether we should or should not. Uh, God doesn't make us do anything. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we don't have to do anything, uh, but He encourages us to. And so this debate is really going to focus around whether we should or whether we shouldn't. And it's very important, uh, as we're going to find out this evening. First of all, I want to show and give an overview of history uh, from creation to today to show that God's original intent, it's very important that we understand God's original intent and whether or not His original intent was for us to keep the Sabbath, or in Hebrew, the Shabbat, 
uh, for all eternity. So we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, and it says, On the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. That Hebrew word there is kadosh. It's, made, it's to be set apart. It's to be made holy. As a matter of fact, it's the very thing that we're commanded to do. is to be set apart and to be made holy. And so he says, because that he had rested from all the work which God had made. Now I want to turn to Mark chapter 2, verse 27. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures here. Only got 20 minutes to get a four-hour uh, message in here. But Mark 2, 27 says, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So here's the question. There are a lot of people that would say that the Sabbath was not given to anybody but Israel. But un unfortunately, the Scriptures tell us otherwise. That it says right here, Jesus Himself says, the Sabbath was made for man. When was it made? I contend it was made in creation. This was before man ever sinned. The intention of God, if man would not sin, let me leave this and posit this question to everyone here tonight. If man had not sinned, we would not be having this debate. We would be keeping the Shabbat on the seventh day exactly the way that he hollowed it, exactly the way that he created it, the exactly the way that he commanded it. And so it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. And I want to show you in the PowerPoint tonight that the word seasons there is not spring, summer, winter, fall. It's very deceiving in the English. In the Hebrew, it's actually Moedim. And in the Strong's 3259, I'm just going to read it to you. It says this, properly an appointment, a fixed time or season, specifically a festival. By implication, it's an assembly, a congregation convened for a definite purpose. Technically, the congregation, by extension, the place of meeting. Talking about the tabernacle. Also, a signal in the sky, appointed. It's a sign, a place of solemn assembly, congregation, a feast, appointed, due season. Do you see, do you catch this? Do you see what the, the, the strong definition of the Hebrew is saying? That God actually, from the very beginning of creation, He did never had the intention that all days were the same. He put sun, moon, and stars in the sky for one purpose. To set the times and the seasons of His anniversaries, of when He wanted to meet with His people. And so from the very beginning, the Sabbath, the, the festivals, the feast days, the very congregation, holy convocation of God were set apart, not for us to decide on our own. He's the maker and the creator of the universe, and he put the stars in the sky so that he could have those times and appointments and we wouldn't miss them. So much so that the Messiah was born under a sign. The signs of his second coming, you say, are all dependent on the stars. So if the, if the debate and the argument is going to be that we can choose the day, then we're obliterating the purpose and the point of God of creating the stars and the sun and the moon and the sky for those such appointments. Also, an argument can be made that, that the Sabbath is not even found in the, in the book of Genesis or that the commandments itself were given on Mount Sinai. I suggest that, yes, they were given on Mount Sinai. They were written down. Like children who won't obey the first time, God said, don't let me come down there. I'm going to write it down. And we see the commandments all over the place, maybe on the detail, but we see them Cain and Abel bringing sacrifices before the sacrificial system was given. We see in Genesis 26, 5, Abraham obeyed my voice and it says it kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And the Hebrew word for law there is Torah, before the Torah was given. There was a relationship. It was written on the heart. There was obviously something that happened. In Genesis chapter 7, we all know the Noah story, that he took two by two. No, he didn't. He took two by two of the unclean animals. But it says in verse 2, you shall take with you seven each of the clean animals, so clearly before Leviticus chapter 11 or the clean and unclean laws were given in the Torah that God already gave these laws in the garden and that's why Noah already knew about these laws. We see in Exodus chapter 16 the Sabbath was given before Mount Sinai. How do we know that? Because in Exodus 16 He commands His people to not go out to pick up the manna on the Shabbat. He says, go out and pick up twice as much, but you better rest on the next day. And ladies and gentlemen, that's before Mount Sinai. Let's take, let's take a look at Isaiah 56, verse 6, and we'll discover that the Gentiles themselves are encouraged to keep the Shabbat. It says, also the sons of the stranger, that word there is, is goyim, the Gentiles, that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him, to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And this finishes with one of the most powerful verses that we all know. 
It says this, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But the entry to the house of all nations was they must keep the Shabbat. Some say the Sabbath cannot be found in the New Testament. We find that all over the place in the New Testament. Matter of fact, one of the most powerful arguments of the Sabbath is everywhere is this. If I give ten commandments to my children and they keep nine of them, but they don't keep one, which one am I going to talk about? The one that they didn't keep. And I suggest that the, the seventh day Sabbath does not have to be reiterated in detail because it's Jerusalem. They're all Jewish people and everyone's keeping the Shabbat. There's no reason to, to chastise them for that. But it says this in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven or earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law till everything is fulfilled. Whoever, listen, we don't quote this verse, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men also shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever doesn't teach them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, Revelation 21 tells us exactly when the Sabbath is done away with. Because the, the, the inference is when heaven and earth pass away. It says the first heaven and the earth will pass away after the millennium. And there will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain as far as I know. We still have all the above and not a single jot or tittle will pass away. I also suggest that the Sabbath is not the least of the commandments. It is one of the top five, one of the greatest. And so if he says you'll be least in the, in, in the kingdom for teaching, the, breaking the least, how much more for breaking the greatest? The Sabbath is included in a generic over umbrella of the commandments itself. Paul says in Romans 3.31, Do we nullify the Torah by this faith, the faith of Jesus? Not at all, rather we uphold the law. The law undoubtedly included the Sabbath. For, for Paul to say he upholds the law of God, but to not uphold the Sabbath, they would have stoned him immediately for that. It was understood. 1 John 5.2, one of my favorite verses, says, By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Ladies and gentlemen, let me point out the obvious. The New Testament has not been written yet. It didn't exist. John, one of the most Jewish apostles, the only thing he could have been talking about is what's called the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, the Torah, the commandments of God, which certainly include the fourth. Revelation chapter 14 says, here is the patience of the saints in verse 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus. In the, in, the, in the tribulation, we see that the God's people are defined by two things. Not just believing in Jesus, but that you prove your love for God, like 1 John says, by keeping His commandments. So we have this interesting paradox or this connection of a, 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 a dichotomy that fits together in a beautiful picture of keeping, proving out your love for God, just like we prove out our love for one another. What would a marriage be like if a husband didn't actually prove his love by doing things for the wife? In the millennium, we even see this. If it's not enough from Genesis to Revelation, in the millennium, we see the Sabbath. Isaiah 66, 22 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says Yahweh, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh, doesn't say all Jewish people, it says all flesh shall come to worship me before the Lord, says Yahweh. So I beg to differ that maybe I could be wrong in this lifetime, but in the millennium, ladies and gentlemen, we will be keeping the Sabbath, and it makes a difference, so much so that there are punishments indicted to mankind for not doing so. And take a look at Zechariah 14, verse 6, when it says that not only the Sabbath, but we will be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, and rain will be cut off from those parts of the world that do not. So, so far, the Sabbath was given to man in the garden on the seventh day and was intended for eternity. Man forgot the Sabbath got caught up in Egypt for 400 years, didn't even remember his God, had to reintroduce him to Moses. So he introduces himself to his people once again and this time writes it down so they don't forget. Jesus kept the Sabbath as well as all the apostolic Christians. The Sabbath is instituted in the millennium as well as the feast days. It was only after the destruction of the temple, the influx of Gentiles and the 18th benediction that cursed Christians in the synagogues that the Gentile Christians began to be detached from the roots of their faith, and to begin embrace a mixture of paganism and biblical truth together. As a matter of fact, it was not God, the Messiah, or the disciples that changed the Sabbath, but it was man's idea and anti-Semitism that changed the Sabbath from its biblical root. 
As time went on, the early church marched further and further from its root, while church officials followed right in the footsteps of the Pharisees, trading the commandments of God for the traditions of men, even making the very thing that God says is eternal. Bondage and labeling it is something that is heretical. In 135, Hadrian, after the Bar Kokhba revolt, outlawed the study of Torah, the circumcision, and observance of the Sabbath, putting huge pressure on the Christians of the day to distance themselves from their Jewish brethren for the sake of survival. Settling the debate about which day that would be the Sabbath, finally in 321 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine said this, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and the people residing in the cities rest and all the workshops be closed. From that day on, there was no way that you were going to go against the church because the church and the state were one in those days. And if you did, you were going to find yourself, if not excommunicated, you could die. And many thousands died for just keeping the Shabbat. This issue was not just a, a black and white issue taken care of at the cross. We see this debate raging on for all the way through the centuries, all the way through Martin Luther, and even today. The only difference with the debate today is that either, neither one of us will kill each other if we're wrong. But in the days before, the West, I hope not. In A.D. 325, Pope Sylvester officially named Sunday, get this, the Lord's Day. And in A.D. 338, just three years later, Eusebius, the court bishop of Constantine, wrote this, All things whatsoever that was the duty to do on the Sabbath, we have now transferred to the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, as more appropriately belonging to it. And if we move forward into the converts' catechism of Catholic, doc Catholic doctrines, we see this for converts, a question and answer. Which is the Sabbath day? They say Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? The Catholic Church answers and says, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea in 336 AD transferred the solemnity of from Saturday to Sunday. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? The Church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday, and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. Of course, today, with modern uh, archaeology and historical uh, documents, we know that it what didn't happen on a Sunday. By what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday? And get this, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plentitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. There are bishops that will even say that those that keep Sunday, Sabbath, are under the jurisdiction of the Roman Catholic Church. History proves, ladies and gentlemen, that the Sabbath was everywhere for multiple centuries. We have Socrates Scholasticus in the 5th century saying this, For although almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries of the Lord's Supper on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath, every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, pagan sun god worship, have ceased to do this. Fifth century. Another historian confirmed this by stating, the people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assembled together on the Sabbath as well as on the first day of the week, which custom is never observed in Rome and Alexandria. Ladies and gentlemen, let me propose a question that should sit in your soul this evening. Who ended up ruling the world? Rome. And whoever rules makes the rules. Today, my contentions are as follows. The Sabbath, number one, was given in the beginning of time and has made clear that God's original intention was for all man and for all time. My opponent will have to prove that the Sabbath was never intended to be kept in the garden or in the millennium and was not given to man as a blessing for rest. Number two, historical accounts prove that the biblical Sabbath was changed without scriptural authority and this change was never given by God, Yeshua, or His disciples, but rather happened over time as Gentile Christians became divorced from their Christian roots. There was an identity crisis amongst Gentile believers after they were kicked out of the synagogues. They naturally created their own brand of interpretations of Scripture that would distance themselves from their Jewish brothers. Remember, 99% of all the, quote, church fathers were pagan, polytheistic, Gentile backgrounds trying to understand a Jewish Bible written by Jews in a Jewish culture using the Hebrew language with anti-Semitism. It's a, it's a formula for a disaster from the very beginning. 
My opponent will have to show where in the scriptures that it is prophesied, the very seal of God's people, it says, and a top five commandment would actually change. After all, in Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing except He reveals it to His prophets first. Furthermore, He'll have to explain while if the intent of Christ was to abolish the Sabbath, the very gift and seal of God to His people, and the disciples knew about this and taught this, why is there not a single straightforward passage in the entire Bible stating this change and why? Ladies and gentlemen, where is the debate? This is the largest single change in the history of the Bible prophecy, and there's not a single dialogue about it inside or outside of biblical scriptures. Where is the debate? Why aren't the Jews in a massive uproar? They killed 11 out of the 12 disciples, my friends, and there's not a single charge against them for keeping the Sabbath or not keeping the Sabbath. If they were teaching their converts to break the Shabbat or saying that every day is the same, they would have pulled them right into the Sanhedrin according to the oral and the, and the law of the Jews and they would have stoned them or killed them on the spot. They tried that even with Paul, if you recall. What does he say? He says that they accuse me of teaching against the law of God. And what happens? He goes in and he's encouraged by the Nazi James to take a Nazarite vow. And he does so to prove that he's not teaching against the law of God, of which the Sabbath is a part. Lastly, my opponent will have to explain how something that is traditionally called bondage in Christianity has been such a blessing for countless thousands of Christians everywhere. If keeping the Sabbath on the day the Bible says is bondage, then how are so many people being healed, relationships, marriages, and families being restored? All they say is a result of beginning to keep the Sabbath. Could it actually be true that God meant what he said on Mount Sinai when he said, I set before you blessings and curses? Blessings, if you keep my commandments. Was God trying to put his people in bondage? Ladies and gentlemen, in the garden, God told man not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The serpent came along and whispered into their ears. God didn't really mean what he said. He knows that if you eat of it, that you'll be more like him. Your eyes will be open and you'll be able to worship him better. I suggest to you today that this strategy is exactly what he's done with the Sabbath. He didn't really mean what he said. Open your eyes and see that Sunday is a much better day to celebrate the Sabbath. After all, God doesn't really care about which day anyway. I believe the enemy has stolen huge blessings from God's people because we keep falling into these deceptive traps. I believe that the burden of proof lies with my opponent to prove that God did not mean what he said and to explain to all of us how what he calls a blessing has now become a burden and a curse. My friends, from the very beginning of this debate that started certainly when the Gentiles of the 18th benediction where the Jewish people and the Christians were meeting on Shabbat together as history proves, but eventually the Christians grew in number and became irritating to the non-believing Jews. And so as they said the 17 prayers, they added an 18th. And in that 18th prayer, it put a curse on all of the Christians. And so they couldn't say the 18th benediction, which means that they were called a heretic and expelled from the synagogues. And that was the beginning of the anti-Semitism in the church. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the same place where we have fallen for the same tactics the enemy has given. And I suggest that we go back to the beginning of the restoration of all things and grab hold of the blessings that we don't even know we're missing. Thank you. And now, Chris Roseborough will present his 20-minute uh, opening statement. First of all, I'd like to thank Passion for the Truth for hosting today's debate, and I'd like to thank Jim Staley for providing us with a succinct summary of his position and for laying out the explanation of his theological approach. My remarks will be directed to this position. So, how do we answer this question? Are we supposed to keep the Sabbath or not as Christians? Well, this question cannot be answered by merely looking at the biblical passages that reference the Sabbath. The commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, does not stand alone, but it is part of an inseparable network of commandments given by Yahweh that is often called the Torah or the Mosaic Covenant. Therefore, this question 
question cannot be answered by looking at what Scripture teaches solely regarding the relationship of Christians who are under a new covenant to the Mosaic covenant. Okay? So my methodology tonight will do this. I'm going to demonstrate that Sabbatarians in both the Hebrew Roots Movement and in the Seventh-day Adventism, and I understand that Jim Staley is technically not in the Hebrew Roots Movement, although he has a similar position, that they do not rightly understand the relationship of Christians to the Mosaic Covenant, and this is due to a faulty hermeneutic, by the way, I'll explain that in a second, in two key passages, Exodus chapter 31, verse 16, and Matthew chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, which Jim just referenced. Once we rightly understand those passages, we'll be able to look at what the rest of the New Testament says regarding the Torah's function and our relationship to it as Christians. And finally, I will demonstrate that the early church fathers rightly understood this relationship, and this fact only provides us with the explanation as to why they worship on the Lord's Day, Sunday, rather than the Sabbath. Now, before we get started... A quick word about hermeneutics. I understand that that's a fancy theological term, and if you're a seminary student, I recommend using that term at parties where girls are at. It'll get you a date. I tried it once. I'm married now. Okay? But basically, hermeneutics is the study and discipline of biblical interpretation. And one of the features of hermeneutics is an understanding of correct reference. You'll hear me use that term a few times tonight and to kind of demonstrate the importance of a proper referent. In fact, what is a text referring to? If you misunderstand a referent, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. So I have a story to tell you about Mr. and Mrs. Snodgrass. Now, Mrs. Snodgrass is a person not unlike many of us. She hates to be stuck in traffic. And for the past few months, she has spent her days dreaming about owning a bright new red sports car. She even on several occasions recently was seen at several car dealerships test driving the newest muscle cars and dreaming of the day that she could zip effortlessly through traffic and uh, go around cars and things like that in her bright new red shiny driving machine. Now, being that her birthday was quickly approaching, she began dropping hints about what she wanted for her birthday to Mr. Snodgrass, and when he finally asked her what she wanted for her birthday, she didn't want to be too direct. So she said, honey, I've been dreaming of owning something that can go from zero to 200 in less than four seconds. Now, Mrs. Snodgrass's birthday arrived, and she was filled with the type of excitement that a five-year-old feels on Christmas morning, although you guys don't celebrate that here, do you? But when she opened Mr. Snodgrass's present, rather than find the keys to a brand-new shiny red muscle car, she found a bathroom scale. Funeral services for Mr. Snodgrass will be held this Tuesday. (laughs) All right. The point of that story is to demonstrate the importance of understanding reference. Although a bathroom scale does go from zero to 200 in less than four seconds, that was not the referent that Mrs. Snodgrass was referring to when she told Mr. Snodgrass what she wanted for her birthday. So properly understanding reference can not only save your life, in the case of Mr. Snodgrass, it can also help you properly understand God's Word. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. And notice, I'm not projecting today, so you get to follow along. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath day, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Now notice, I should put some echo on that. Forever, ever, 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 ever. Now, at first glance, this seems pretty cut and dried. It seems to be saying that the Sabbath will be observed for eternity. After all, isn't that what the words covenant forever mean? Well, answer no. When you pay closer attention to the text's referent, you will discover that it is not saying that the Sabbath will be observed for eternity. Now, in order to demonstrate why this is the case, we're going to look at a couple of cross-references in the book of Exodus that use this exact type of language. Exodus chapter 21, verses 2 through 6, reads this. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons and daughters, and a wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the, if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out 
free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. Forever, forever, forever. Question, is Yahweh actually revealing that someone will be another person's slave for eternity? Well, before we answer that, let's look at another passage. Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 and 21 says this, You shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn. In the tent of meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening to morning before the Lord, and it shall be a statute forever to be observed through all their generations by the people of Israel. Well, where is this lamp today? It doesn't exist. God's Word says that this will be a statute forever. God Does God's Word contradict itself? How can this be a statute forever if there is no way to observe this statute? Well, the answer is simple. The Hebrew word in play in all three of these texts is the Hebrew word olam. And the question we need to answer is whether or not the referent in Exodus 31.16, our original text, is eternity or something else. Now, when you do your semantic research, you will find that olam does not always mean eternity, but oftentimes is referring only to a duration of time. As H.M. Riggle correctly noted in his book, From the Lord's Day, uh, From the Sabbath to the Lord's Day, he said this, forever, speaking of spiritual things and future destinies, etc., means unending. It is also used in speaking of laws to indicate that they are in continuous force, standing permanent. In such case, it indicates a law is unchangeable and unrepealable while the system of which it is a part lasts. As Old Testament scholar Harold Dressler noted, the Sabbath is not viewed as a universal ordinance for all of mankind. Instead, it is a specific institution for Israel. As a sign of the covenant, it was to last only as long as that covenant, not forever. Next passage, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, Jesus is speaking here, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, Sabbatarians of all stripes misread this text and believe that the referent of the clause, until heaven and earth pass away, means that the Mosaic law is, in, is going to be in effect until heaven and earth pass away or until mil, or, or the millennium. This is a misreading of the text which can easily be cleared up by reading some good scholarly commentaries as well as some empl- employing some good hermeneutical principles, namely that principle that Scripture interprets Scripture and that clear passages always govern unclear passages and never the other way around. Now, if this passage were saying that the Mosaic law is in effect until heaven and earth pass away, then the Bible contradicts itself, and here's why. Hebrews 10.1 says this, The law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. Hebrews 10.9 says this, He does away with the first covenant in order to establish the second. Notice it says he does away with it. Hebrews 7 11-12, through now if perfection had been obtainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for for righteousness to everyone who believes. Galatians 3, 19, Well, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And Galatians 3, 23 through 26, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. In other words, we're no longer under the law. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Romans 6, 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but you are under grace. 
All of these clear passages that Christians are not under the law and that the, uh, that the book of Hebrews makes crystal clear that the law ha- was but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. Therefore, the referent of the phrase until heaven and earth pass away is not the idea that the law will be in effect until the end of the world. Instead, if you do your homework, you'll discover that scholars like R.T. France, John P. Meyer, Robert J. Banks, they all note that the phrase until heaven and earth pass away is an idiomatic statement. Uh It's similar to our statement until hell freezes over. The basic meaning of this idiom is that, well, that will never happen. And when you understand this fact, then you can rightly understand that the referent that this text is pointing to, namely, it is not saying that the law will be in effect until the end of the world instead, but that none of it will ever disappear until it is fulfilled. In fact, the Greek phrase in this sentence, there's two until clauses, and the second one governs everything else in it until all is fulfilled. Or as Riggle states, quote, that is the idea, not the length of time the law was to continue, but the certainty that it would not fail to be fulfilled. And that is exactly what Jesus did. He fulfilled the law just like he said he would. That is why we are no longer under the law, and that includes the requirements to keep the Sabbath. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 7 says this, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old than the old as the covenant that he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would been, have been no occasion for, uh, to look for a second. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. The Mosaic covenant, according to Hebrews 8, has been made obsolete by Christ. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and is already ready to vanish away. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15 states, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Ephesians 2, 14 makes it clear. 14 to 15. The law and its ordinances and its commandments against us have been abolished. So Christians are not obligated to keep the Mosaic Covenant. Under the New Covenant, Christians are not obligated to observe the Passover, circumcise their male children, keep a kosher diet, appear before Yahweh three times a year in the city of Jerusalem, which, by the way, Torah expressly says you must do, celebrate the new moons or the Sabbaths. Those were all types and shadows. And now that Christ has come, the shadows have given way to their rightful substance. The late Walter Martin tells a great story. Um, about a man who would go away on business trips. And he had gone away on a particularly long business trip. And when he was gone, his wife says, I miss you so much. I miss you. I wish you were here. And so it was a bright, sunny day. The plane came back. It was one of those types of planes where when you get off the plane, you come down the ramp and the stairs and you go on the tarmac. And as soon as his wife saw him on the tarmac, she runs to give him a hug. And then seeing his shadow, he she falls on the ground and starts kissing his shadow. That's ridiculous, though, right? Of course it is. Because the law, according to the New Testament, is shadow. Jesus is the substance. Colossians 2, 13 through 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are the shadow of things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Notice in Colossians chapter 2, it expressly says, Paul expressly says, not to let anyone judge you regarding a Sabbath because they are shadow. Christ is the substance. Right? I've got to watch my time here. Now, let me do a little bit of a survey. And in my rebuttal time, I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time demonstrating from the writings of the church fathers that it was Christians way early, first, early, second century, who were already observing the Lord's Day, not the Sabbath. The idea that Constantine is responsible for this plays well if you're into Da Vinci Code type conspiracies, but actually doesn't stand up to scrutiny when you actually read the church fathers. But I want to take a look at what Scripture says regarding the eighth day. The eighth day is the day when Jesus rose from the dead. 
It's the beginning of a new creation. Christ is the first fruits of a new creation. His resurrection marks the beginning of something completely radically new. And so we read in Luke chapter 24 that on the eighth day they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now, this was the first day of the week which Christ rose. In John chapter 20, we find out on that first day of the week, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Remember, Thomas missed that meeting. And so, the next one week later, on Sunday, the first day of the week, it says his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. See, already the disciples were in the habit of meeting on the first day. And who shows up on the first day? Jesus himself. Who showed up on the first day also? Well, the Holy Spirit himself. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 16, we read this, You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, and you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you shall present grain offering and new grain to the Lord. This is regarding the Feast of Pentecost. And so, we learn in Acts chapter 2, on the day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, it was the Holy Spirit who arrived, and what were the apostles doing? They were already gathered together. Acts chapter 20, verse 27 says this, the Apostle Paul talking, you know, talking about the Apostle Paul's journey to Troas. He says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. When did the church meet? According to Acts 20, verse 7, they met on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1-2. through 2. Now concerning the collection, the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also uh, you are also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up that he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. In Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Over and again, when we read in Scriptures about what the church was doing, they were meeting to commemorate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And there was not a single commandment in the New Testament regarding keeping the Sabbath. And the reason for this is because all the clear passages make it clear that the Torah and its ordinances and its feasts and new moons and Sabbath were all canceled. The old covenant has passed. The new has come. The type and shadow have given way to the substance, and the substance is Christ. So, as I've demonstrated, Sabbatarians, including those in the Hebrew Roots movement, misread Exodus 31, verse 16, and Matthew 5, 16 through 18. And now that we understand that, we understand the passages that show that we are under the new covenant and that we are no longer under Torah and its ordinances and its Sabbaths and its new moons and its feasts. Now, when I come back, I'll spend a little bit of time in the church fathers to demonstrate that it wasn't the fourth century when things changed. It was the first century. And already the, the, new, the church fathers by the second century were observing the Lord's Day, the first day, not the Sabbath. And uh, now we will move into the first rebuttal period with Jim Staley presenting his 10-minute rebuttal. I can see that Chris's strategy is to bog me down by tra chasing him through all these scriptures. It's a great strategy. I don't even know where to start. There's so many. Um, I will concede right off the bat that the Christians, early Christians, were meeting on the first day of the week. History tells us, and we even know the evolution of how it happened. But because they were meeting on the first day of the week, ladies and gentlemen, there's other passages, they were meeting every day. And so they were meeting every time they got together. They were to remember uh, the Lord's Supper and to, uh, and to and convene and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. But meeting on the first day does not obliterate a commandment. No more uh, than... than uh, and by the way, let me just bring this up. If my opponent is correct... And the law has been done away with. And if we want to make this debate over that issue, and I understand it's ancillary and part of it, 
That's absolutely fine, but the mistake that he is making is that the Ten Commandments are connected to the law of God. Matter of fact, uh, so much so that if my opponent is correct and the law of God is completely obliterated and done away with, ladies and gentlemen, we can commit adultery. We can murder. We can do anything we want because there is no law. Matter of fact, I would point my opponent to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 that says that the definition of sin is this. Sin is the transgression of God's law. So if my opponent is correct and the law of God is done away with, then we don't have a single other definition of sin in the entire Bible. And we've got a theological nightmare on our hands because uh, the Baptist organization alone over the last 50 years has spent $2 billion on missions to tell people about Jesus around the world, which is a lofty and amazing uh, goal that I fully support. But why are we telling anybody about Jesus if the law of God is done away with? Because the definition of sin is breaking the law of God. And so if the law of God is done away with, there's no definition of sin. There's no reason to tell them that they need Jesus for, for what? For breaking something that doesn't exist. We should save our money in that case. I would suggest that we're reading the Scriptures wrong. We don't understand uh, the definition of God's law in the first century and the idiomatic expressions and the oral law and everything puts together in the way that it is. And here's why. When he says under the law, we're no longer under the law, I'll cut to the chase and let you know that it's not an American English the way we read that is we're no longer under the law, meaning that we don't have to keep it. In English today, it's, the exact, it's a legal expression that means exactly the way it means today. The Constitution of the United States, ladies and gentlemen, is not done away with. If we, are not un if we are under the law, that means you broke it. You're under it. You're under the penalty of the law. It's an idiomatic expression in Hebrew, first century culture, that was very obvious, that you're not under the penalty of the law. God came not to remove what he called his word, which ended up being made flesh. He came to remove the penalty. And in Colossians chapter 2, when my opponent begins to tell you that what was nailed to the cross was the ordinances, it is not the ordinances of God's law, my friends, that were nailed to the cross. We have Paul, very schizophrenic, who says he upholds those very same ordinances that my opponent says is nailed to the cross. What was nailed to the cross in the first century was there was ordinances, and the Aramaic makes it very clear, it says the, the bonds and the written ordinances of our sin. Meaning that on Judgment Day, what you are held accountable to, there are two books, the book of life and the book of works. And so if your name is not found in the book of, of life, everything that you do is found in a book with ordinances, handwritings that are written against you. If you get a ticket for speeding, and I want to come in and I want to, uh, I want to free you from that. Do I go to the United States Supreme Court and ask them to obliterate the law of all stop signs and speed limits? Or do I simply pay your ticket and remove the ordinances that stood against you? So let's begin. There's so many places to go. The first day of the week, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, we can look at that. First of all, it does not say that they met on Sunday in this verse, only that they were to set an offering aside. He says on the first of the week, which by the way, there is argument, uh, Chris, that the first of the week in Hebrew could actually possibly mean one of the Sabbaths. Now, I don't subject, subject to that. I actually believe that it means one of Sabbath, which is how they counted in the first century, the first day till Sabbath, the second day till Sabbath, because everything was about the Sabbath. So by the mere fact that they even chose the Greek phrase, mea sabbaton, proves the fact that they were counting, the entire counting system in the first century revolved around the Sabbath. Because it does not say on Sunday. It does not even say the first day of the week. It says one of Shabbat. And every historical uh, commentator uh, that knows the original language in its context knows that that's how they counted. It was one of the Shabbat, two of the Shabbat. And so they met on the first of the Shabbat, but it does not say... Uh, that they met on this verse. It only said that they were to set aside an offering on this. And what's even more interesting is the Greek phrase, lay by him in store. Every commentator that I could find uh, of a Greek uh, uh, academia says this, that it means store it up at home. There was no bringing it to church. There was no church, ladies and gentlemen, in the first century. It was the synagogues, and the synagogues were closed. On Sunday, it was the Romans that kept their Sabbath on the Sunday, the venerable day of the sun. He also mentions Romans chapter 14, verse 4 and 5. 
Let's read it in its entire context. It says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Ladies and gentlemen, we are led to believe that on the Shabbat, that, that there, was a, there was not even a debate in the first century of when the seventh day is. And we are led to believe that there was a debate, a heavy debate in the first century on which day the Sabbath was. If we read this context carefully and we understand the culture and what the debates were, the debate is over fasting. This day was over. They fasted two times a week. Pharisees did it on one day. Uh, the, other, uh, the, the, the Sadducees did it on a different day. This is a huge debate on which camp you're going to come into, and the context gives it away. In verse 1 it says, Receive who one is weak in the faith, but, but do not dispute over doubtful things, for one believes he may eat all things. And the very next verse, after verse 6, says, He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats eats unto the Lord, and he who gives God thanks, for he does not eat. The whole context is about food, but we are led to believe by uh, commentators that this is about the Sabbath. This is not about the Sabbath. It is simply about food. Running out of uh, time here, so let me go back to all the things that he had mentioned. Pentecost was not on Sunday, ladies and gentlemen. The history records tell us otherwise. Uh, we go back to this. We go back to the writings of Josephus, the first century Jewish historian. It says, but on the second day of unleavened bread, which is the 16th of the month. So you have to know about the first century feast days is that the 14th is when the Passover meal was. The very next day was the 15th. Okay. The 15th is the first day of unleavened bread, which is a high Shabbat on, a, on the Hebrew calendar. The 16th is the day that they started counting for the Feast of Shavuot, or in Greek, Pentecost. If you count 50 days from the 16th, it is not on a Sunday. It can be on any day. It is only the Christian church, uh, mainly, and some sects of, of, uh, in Messianic circles that believe that the Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost, was on Sunday. Even in the Aramaic versions of Targum, Onkelos, on Leviticus 23.15, the very scriptures that are used to tell us when that happens. It says, and count to you after the festival day from the day you brought the Omer of the Elevation seven weeks after the festival day. Which one? Not on Shabbat. It's after the high Shabbat. So the mistake that Christians make not understanding the culture of the Hebrews is they believe that's the weekly Sabbath, not understanding that the first day of unleavened bread is a high Sabbath. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, that's a big one. A lot of people get this one misunderstood, so I'm just going to go over it real quick and I'll end with it, even though there's every single one of the verses uh, that my opponent has brought up, every one of them have been misunderstood. I could go through each one of them, and I have many teachings on each one of these. So, for he is himself our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of contained in commandments, as I already make, made that very clear, that he's not getting rid of the law of God, or we've got massive schizophrenia in the New Testament of disciples telling us to keep the commandments of God, to keep the law of God. And I will leave you with this. In Romans chapter 8, it says this. It says this. In verse 9, it says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit of life is because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life. So he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for we are not uh, to live by the flesh but of the Spirit. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, for you do not receive the spirit of bondage. He says, the spirit, for you do not receive the spirit of bondage, but uh, against the spirit of adoption by who we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness, and he goes on and says that those who have the spirit of God actually keep the law of God. Those who are in the flesh cannot. Thank you. Chris Roseboro will now make his 10-minute rebuttal. All right, I'd like to ask you to consider something here. Which story has better explanatory power? What I'm going to read to you is from the writings of the early church fathers long before Constantine, long before the arrogation of the Bishop of Rome to becoming the sole pope over uh, Catholicism. And ask yourself this question. Which 
explanation has better explanatory power. What I'm going to read to you is going to basically show you that Christians from the earliest time did not keep the Sabbath. In fact, they make a point of pointing out that they didn't. Now, is the reason why they didn't because they understood, like I pointed out from the text that I showed you, that the Mosaic Covenant, which is type and shadow, has given way to the substance, as Hebrews says. Because the law of Moses has been canceled and its obligations have been canceled. And by the way, I'll get to the issue regarding can we then commit adultery? Of course not. Okay? I'll explain that probably in my next rebuttal. But ask yourself this question, which has better explanatory power? Because Christians understood that they were no longer under the Mosaic Covenant or because of some kind of a conspiracy and misunderstanding of the, of the text. From the Didache, written in the first century. By the way, it reads as a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Here's what it says. But every Lord's Day do ye gather yourselves together and you break bread and give thanksgiving, having confessed your transgressions that your sacrifice may be pure. The epistle of Barnabas, Barnabas is not a Greek, says this, we keep the eighth day, by the way, this is late first century, we keep the eighth day, which is Sunday, with joyfulness, and the day also in which Jesus rose again from the dead, also from the epistle of Barnabas. Moreover, God says to the Jews, your new moons and your Sabbaths I cannot endure. You see how he says the present Sabbaths are not acceptable to me, but the Sabbath which I have made in which... When I have rested from all things, I will make from the beginning of the eighth day, which is the beginning of another world. Wherefore, we Christians keep the eighth day for joy, on which also Jesus rose from the dead, and when he appeared and ascended into heaven. Epistle of Barnabas, by the way. Um, Justin Martyr, if you have not read his dialogues with Trypho, a Jew, I would strongly recommend that you take the time to do it. It's a fascinating early 2nd century account. And Justin Martyr literally lived and converted you know, to uh, Christianity. Early 2nd century, he was a philosopher, and he t spells all of this out. And so in this dialogue that he has with a Jew, he's not speaking as one who is an anti-Semite. In fact, he's very cordial and very kind to the Jew that he's talking to, and he's explaining the differences. In fact, reading uh, this dialogue... The Jew immediately says, you know, you Christians are kind of like, you know, upstarts. Why don't you keep the Sabbaths? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you get circumcised, okay? So Justin, who was martyred for his faith, in his dialogue, says this. He says, he then speaks of those Gentiles, namely us, who in every place offer sacrifices to him, that's Jesus, the bread of the Eucharist and also the cup of the Eucharist, affirming both that we glorify his name and that you profane it. The command of circumcision, again, bidding them always circumcise the children on the eighth day, was a type of the true circumcision by which we are circumcised from deceit and iniquity through him who rose from the dead on the first day after the Sabbath, namely, our Lord Jesus Christ. For the first day after the Sabbath remains the first day of all days. It's called, however, the eighth, according to the number of the days of the cycle, and yet remains the first. Mark, Justin also says this. He says, Those who have persecuted and do persecute Christ, if they do not repent, shall not inherit anything on the holy mountain. But the Gentiles who have believed on him have repented of their sins, which they have committed, and they shall receive the inheritance along with the patriarchs and the prophets, and just men who are descended from Jacob, even though they neither keep the Sabbath nor are circumcised nor observe the feasts, assuredly they shall receive the holy inheritance of God. So here, Justin Martyr, one of the early Christians, this is 60 years after the death of the Apostle John, is basically saying that those who don't keep the Sabbath, are not circumcised, don't observe the feast, assuredly they're going to receive the inheritance. Why? Because all of those things were type and shadow. Justin also says this, But if we do not admit this, we shall be liable to fall into foolish opinion. And if it were not the same God who existed in the times of Enoch and all rest, who neither were circumcised after the flesh, nor observed Sabbaths, nor any other rites, seeing that Moses enjoined such observances. Let me translate. That's kind of tough English. Uh, Justin notes the fact that Adam didn't keep the Sabbath, Abraham didn't keep the Sabbath, Yahob did not keep the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath didn't show up until 2,500 years after humans were created. And he's noting that the patriarchs did not keep the Sabbath. And that it was Moses who enjoined the children of Israel, for that. And it says, 
For if there was no need of circumcision before Abraham or of the observance of Sabbaths, of feasts and sacrifices before Moses, well, no more need is there of them now. After that, according to the will of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has been born without sin of a virgin, sprung from the stock of Abraham. Justin also says this, On the day called the Sabbath, all who live in cities or in the country gather together uh, to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles, and, oh, I'm sorry, on the day that's called Sunday, Sorry, I put in the word Sabbath. On the day that's called Sunday, all who live in the cities, they gather together and read the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. And then when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and we pray. As we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought. And the president, in like manner, offers prayers. That would be your pastor. And thanksgiving according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution to each and a participation of that over which thanks has been given. And those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And they who are well to do and willing give what each thinks fit. And what is collected is deposited with the president, who succors the orphans and the widows and those through sickness or any other cause, are in want, and those who are in bonds and strangers sojourning among us, and a word takes care of all of those who are in need. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. For he was crucified on that day before the Saturday, and on the day after the uh, Saturday, which is the day of Sunday, having appeared to his apostles and and disciples, he taught them these things, which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So you see, early in the second century, Justin Martyr takes the time to explain to us what sounds exactly like a church service and makes the point that the earliest Christians all gathered on the first day of the week to worship, to receive the Lord's Supper, to take up tithes and offerings, although it wasn't really a tithe, but take up a collection for the orphans and to care for them and to hear the Word of God. This is what they did. This sounds exactly like a Sunday church service. And this was long before Constantine ever walked the earth, before his grandmommy and grandpappy even got together, right? In AD 200, Tertullian, great apologist, says this, We solemnize the day after Saturday in contradistinction to those who call this day their Sabbath. Tertullian also says this, It follows accordingly that insofar as the abolition of carnal circumcision and of the old law is demonstrated as having been consummated at its specific times, so also the observance of the Sabbath is demonstrated to have been temporary. Writing in 200 A.D. So, ask yourself this question. I can go on and quote more. I can quote Origen. I can quote Augustine. I can quote a whole bunch of other church fathers that make it clear what's going on. But early on, the Christian church, the earliest church fathers, all acknowledged the fact that the Sabbath was done away with. They're no longer under the Mosaic Covenant, and that they worship now on the day when Jesus Christ rose bodily from the grave, and that he being the first fruits of a new creation, they commemorate that new creation the eighth day not the seventh-day Sabbath, which was a shadow. The reality is in Christ. Is the reason why they did this? Because they understood the scriptures that I quoted to you that say that we're no longer under the Mosaic Covenant? Or were they, well, anti-Semites, people who didn't understand the Hebrew roots of Christianity and misunderstood the scriptures, or worse, were part of some conspiracy? I put forward to you that the reasonable explanation for these quotes is that they understood just what the scriptures said, that we are no longer under the Mosaic Covenant. It's given way to the New Covenant. Jim Staley will now make his seven-minute rebuttal. My opponent asked the question, are these first and second century church fathers, quote-unquote, are they anti-Semites? Let's discover. Justin Martyr, who he quote multiple times to prove that church services were on Sunday, which I fully agree. But the mistake that my opponent is making is that the church had already become apostate on this issue 
as we will discover. And should we trust church fathers that had no, virtually no uh, Hebraic or uh, uh, training and were very much anti-Semites, as we shall discover? Justin Martyr, who he quoted multiple times to prove his case, dialogue with Trypho between 138 and 161 A.D., says this, we too would observe your circumcision of the flesh, your Sabbath days, and in a word, all of your festivals, if it were not aware of the reason why they were imposed upon you, namely because of your sins and the hardness of your hearts. The custom of circumcising the flesh handed down from Abraham was given to you as a distinguishing mark to set you off from other nations and from us Christians. The purpose of this was that you and only you might suffer the afflictions that are now justly yours. That only your land be desolated, your cities be ruined by fire, and that the fruits of your land be eaten by strangers before your very eyes. That not one of you be permitted to enter your city of Jerusalem. Your circumcision of the flesh is only a mark by which you can certainly be distinguished from other men. As I stated before, it was by reason of your sins and the sins of your fathers that among your precepts God imposed upon you the observance of the Sabbath as a mark. Even though it was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my opponent says that none of them are recorded to keep it. He kept all the commandments of God, it says right there in Genesis chapter 26, of which the Sabbath, according to the New Testament, Jesus himself said it was given and made for man. Certainly, he would be keeping the Sabbath. John Christentum of 344 AD says, one of the greatest of the church fathers, by the way, he's called the Golden Mouth, said this, a missionary preacher famous for his sermons and addresses said the synagogue is worse than a brothel. It's a den of scoundrels and a repair of wild beasts. The temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults. The refuge of brigands and debaucheries. And the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews. A place of meeting for assassins of Christ. A house worse than a drinking shop. A den of thieves. A house of ill fame. Dwelling of iniquity. The refuge of devils. A gulf and abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. As for me, I hate the synagogue. I hate the Jews for the same reason. He said he would go on and, and quote St. Augustine if he had time. I will pick up the ball where he left off. In 354, St. Augustine says this, How hateful to me are the enemies of your scriptures. How I wish that you would slay them, the Jews, with your two-edged swords. So that be, there should be none to oppose your word. Gladly would I have them die to themselves and live to you. On and on it goes that the so-called church fathers are heavily slanted against the Jewish people and against their Jewish roots, if you will, because of the anti-Semitism. They did not understand the scriptures. They did not speak Hebrew fluently. They did not understand the Jewish idioms of the day. Why? There was not a single one there to explain it to them. These are Greek philosophical people coming into faith in Christ, which is great, but understanding the Scriptures the way that the Jewish people wrote them was something foreign to them, as we already have seen. He brings up the shadow of coming on the tarmat and the, the wife that has the shadow, and you come down and you hug the wife. I would suggest and totally agree that the feast days, the festivals are all shadows. Ladies and gentlemen, the shadows are there to lead you to the reality. So if you want to be close to the Messiah and you can't figure out where you're at, you might want to start with the shadows which would lead you to the foot of the Messiah. It's a straw man argument to say that the shadow is done away with. It's not done away with by the mere fact that the shadow is there, ladies and gentlemen, in his own example, it proves that the shadow never leaves. As long as the Son of the living God, if you will, stands behind and casts the, the, the light upon the Son itself, it will always cast a shadow, which is why we see the festivals and the feast days and the Shabbat, which I agree, are shadows in the millennium. If there was any time that we would do away with the shadows, would you not think that it would be in the millennium? If there was any time that we should do away with the shadows, shouldn't it be in the creation itself? Why would it be given whatsoever? But he has not addressed any of my contentions that the Sabbath itself was given in creation before man sinned, was never intended to ever be taken away. Jesus gives us very clear instructions that it was given to man and he gives instructions on how to keep it. Man was working in the garden, ladies and gentlemen. He needed a rest. If we take away the physical from the spiritual, that's like Yeshua, Jesus, when he tells and talks about the commandment of murder. 
And he gives the spiritual principle behind it that you, if you even think of hatred in your heart, you have committed murder. So he brings the spiritual and connects it to the physical. Are we be led to believe, ladies and gentlemen, that because Jesus gives us the spiritual to the commandment, that the physical application is done away with? Shall I not have hate in my heart, but can I still commit murder? The physical and the spiritual are connected. They are not separate. No more than a shadow is separate from the reality on the meeting of the first day of the week, even Michael Brown, the world's expert on apologist, uh, an apologist on uh, proving that Jew, the Jewish uh, Messiah is Yeshua himself, and on over 20 books, says this, there is no biblical support. And by the way, he does not believe that the Sabbath is for today. He says there is no biblical support for the view that after the resurrection of Jesus, the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. There is some evidence that as early as the late 1st or 2nd century, believers gathered before or after work on Sundays to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. But this was not related to the concept of the Sabbath. And strong arguments can be made against the Sabbath being changed to Sunday within the New Testament itself. It was not until the 4th century that the church formally declared that the Sabbath had been moved to Sunday with the question begged to be asked, by what authority do you do this? This is from the world's greatest apologist on many issues. And he doesn't even believe in the Sabbath. And he understands that the Sabbath being them meeting on the first day of week had nothing to do with the Sabbath itself. Thank you. Chris Roseborough will now make his way to the podium for his seven-minute rebuttal. I find it fascinating that uh, one of the world's foremost apologists hasn't read the Church Fathers because I just quoted the Church Fathers that showed that the Sabbath wasn't observed by 1st and 2nd century Christians. So apparently, the world's foremost Christian apologist hasn't read those Church Fathers. Kind of sad. Anti-Semitism. How is it anti-Semitic for, Trif uh, for uh, Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo to quote Galatians 3.19? How is that anti-Semitism? Galatians 3.19 says this, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Pointing that out to his Jewish dialogue partner does not make him an anti-Semite. Okay? That's uh, stretching the bonds of credulity when it comes to the definition of the word anti-Semitism. And also quoting John Christostom, who is a great preacher, by the way. I recommend you read his sermons. They're fantastic, especially his sermons on the Gospel of John. Um, quoting John Chrysostom, what, 5th, 6th century, um, has no bearing on the quotes that I brought up from the 1st and 2nd century Christian church fathers. Now, again, remind you, Ephesians chapter 2, 14 through 15, this is not Roseboro, this is Scripture, for he himself, Jesus is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Again, ask yourself the question, why were the earliest Christian church fathers that I quoted not observing the Sabbath? Reason? Because Scripture says that Christ has abolished the law of commandments expressed in its ordinances. Now, regarding the question, can we commit adultery as Christians? Now, as a Lutheran, I'm not supposed to quote the Epistle of James. There's some kind of unwritten rule. Luther didn't seem to like the Epistle of James, but I have to break that rule tonight. So I hope that you will give me a little bit of latitude. James does something very interesting in chapter 2. Fantastic chapter on faith, by the way. And he makes an interesting distinction. Remember, I told you, it's, this is all about reference and, and hermeneutics and making sure you have the proper referent. Here's what James says. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, and when you pay attention to that, what is the royal law? He's referring to Torah, but specifically to the commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, well, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Which, by the way, that's the purpose of the law, to show us our transgression. So, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. 
James makes a distinction between the Torah and the law of liberty. Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, and he is the one who's given us a new command. Remember, Jesus says, a new command I give you as I have loved you, love one another. James picks up, on, picks up on this and says, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Christ is the mediator of a new covenant and has given us a new law. And Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7-9 through 9, says this, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey God, the gospel of our Lord. Right. Now, regarding moral laws, there's a lot of debate, a lot of ink spilled on this, but basically the question comes down to what function does Torah serve? Is there continuity or total discontinuity between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? And it's important to note this that the commandments, you shall not murder, you not, shall not steal, you shall not commit adul- adultery, you shall not you know, bear false witness, they all get rolled up in the New Testament. But none of the commandments regarding the Sabbath, none of the commandments regarding keeping of the new moons or the feast days or the Passover, none of those get rolled up into it. So when you talk about continuity and discontinuity between it, understand that what gets transferred over to the New Covenant still stands. And none of the feast days or Sabbaths still stand. And this is why the Christians didn't observe them, but they had extremely high morals. In fact, I would argue that the morals that Jesus and the disciples call for are greater and more stringent and more difficult than any of the commandments in the Torah. Okay? And Paul does this, by the way, in Romans chapter 13. He says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. Ah, love is the fulfillment of the law, right? For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, Torah. You shall not murder, Torah. You shall not steal, Torah. You shall not covet, Torah. And any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love, love is the fulfilling of the law. Christ has not called his church to lawlessness. He has fulfilled the law for us. And now it calls us to walk in freedom, and that freedom is loving one another. So the idea that without the Torah over us, we, can't, we would be immoral, oh, that's nonsense. You haven't read your scriptures. So that's my last point there. Okay, we now move into a new phase of the debate as both participants uh, make their way to the podium and uh, where Jim Staley will conduct the first uh, 10 minute cross examination of Chris Rosebro. First, I would like to say that just because there's no uh, record or, or an argument from silence of the Shabbat not being found by name and commandment in the New Testament does not mean that it does not exist. I would like to point out that bestiality is also not mentioned in the New Testament as a commandment, and neither is tithing, both of which all Christians believe uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, Chris, yes. um, what denomination is your background again? Um, I uh, baptized Roman Catholic, uh, grew up Nazarene, spent some time in the um, latter rain movement, super hyper charismatic, which has morphed into the New Apostolic Reformation, um, went back to the Nazarene church, and uh, now I'm a Lutheran, not by choice. I was drug into it, kicking and screaming. Okay. <laughs> I don't have this question, but why are you letting that happen? But in any case... <laughs> uh, you don't seem like a person that gets drugged easily. Uh, interestingly enough, in 1530, the Augsburg Confession of Faith mm-hmm. is the primary confession of faith of the Lutheran Church, one of the most important documents in the Lutheran Reformation. Yep. And they say this, uh, in Article 28 it says, they, the Catholics, allege that the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue as it appears. Neither is there any example more boastful of then uh, than changing the Sabbath day. Great, they say, is the power and authority of the church since it dispensed with one of the Ten 
commandments, and I find it interesting that the very denomination that you belong to also believes that it is arrogant and actually virtually impossible to dispense with one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, my next question is, do you believe that the Sabbath is part of the commandments of God? Um, yes, it's in the Torah. Okay. So when Yeshua said to the one who asked him in Matthew 19, 6, how to inherit eternal life, uh, do you remember what his answer was? Yeah. Uh, keep the commandments. Right. Keep the, the commandments. Second, second table of the law. Right. So he says to keep the commandments, uh, do you still believe that the Sabbath was part of the commandments of God? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you believe that the, commandment, uh, the Sabbath is part of the commandments of God, and he says if you want to enter in, in eternal life, you should keep the commandments. So then do you admit that Yeshua is telling this man to keep the Sabbath as part of his relationship to God? Absolutely. I can see that I just won the debate. No. <laughs> <laughs> you did take me for a loop there. I wasn't expecting a yes. Um, for the record, my opponent believes that Jesus just told the disciples to keep the Sabbath. Well, no, he told in the, the he New told, Testament. He told that guy, and p keep in mind that's prior to Jesus' fulfillment of the of the Sabbath. But you had mentioned earlier that the Sabbath was not mentioned in the New Testament. But we just conceded that his intention was definitely the Sabbath. Uh, again, there was there's no commandment after Jesus' death rolled up in the writings of the apostles or the prophets or Jesus that tell us to keep the Sabbath. And either in this particular case, Jesus has to keep that because he's still under the Torah himself because he's fulfilling it for us. Living in bondage. Right. Uh, do you believe that when Jesus said in Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man and not for man for the Sabbath, that Yeshua was referring to the seventh-day Sabbath that's found in the creation account? Um, yes, I disagree with your a application of the word anthropos. Okay, so, but you do believe that when he says in Mark 2, 27, he's talking about the Sabbath, he's talking about the, the seventh day uh, that is mentioned in creation. Yes, and this, okay. is, this is about a taxonomy issue. Okay, and so, um, so if they are the same Sabbath given to all men, um, the difference is the Sinai account is choosing a group of people in, in the way that I view this as captains of the team to go get the rest of the team because the, the Sabbath was given in the garden before man sinned. And have, all do you have men, a question? Do you have all a question? Men, all men were you have given a, you have a question? Uh, the Sabbath. I'm going to ask you. Because you're making a statement. Uh, yes. Do you agree with my statement? I, 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 that was my question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my next question. He wants me to ask the next question. Do you believe that the Sabbath was part of God's law? Uh, yeah, we've established this. Okay. Just making sure. Then what do you say, the, uh, Chris, is the definition of sin? Definition of sin is to transgress God's law. Okay. Uh, so would you agree then if someone breaks the Sabbath that they're transgressing the law? If you are an Israelite under Torah, absolutely. Okay. So, so you're saying that the Sabbath is only given to Israel? Absolutely. Okay. So I thought we just established that, uh, that Jesus said uh, in Mark chapter 2 that the Sabbath was made for man. And, ask, and, ask, and, and also, Paul says that the entire world is guilty before God. You can't be guilty of breaking something that is Are you going to make more statements? Are you going to ask me a question? Cause Here's I think my next question. I'd like to answer your question, actually. Is it against the law for Gentiles to keep the Sabbath? Is it against the law for Gentiles to keep the Sabbath? That's kind of a category error. Well, you said that the, that the law was only given to Israel. So is it against the law for the Gentiles to keep the Sabbath? No, if a Gentile wants to become an Israelite and uh, live under the ordinance of Israel, they're, f they're free to do that. So, is, is the, is the covenant, you're saying that the covenant of God was given to Israel? That's correct. Okay, who was the new covenant given to? Uh, the whole world. But we're grafted into Israel. Okay, so then you are Israel. Yes, I, of course, I'm grafted into Israel. I'm a, I am a walla, wild olive branch grafted into okay. spiritual Israel. So if you are grafted into Israel, that means you're part of the Israel covenant of which you just said that the Sabbath was given to. Say that again. <laughs> you just said that you were part of Israel. Yes. You also said that the covenant of the Sabbath was only given to Israel. So by extension, that would mean that you were under the law and jurisdiction of the Sabbath. No, absolutely not, because Scripture makes it clear that the old covenant has passed away. But it's the new canceled. covenant is given to Israel. The, that's correct. The new covenant is given to Israel. Okay. And you are I'm part of Israel. Israel. Correct. Okay. And the covenant was given to Israel, of course, as well as the Sabbath, of which uh, uh, we are There's no Sabbath keeping in the new covenant. Okay. Except for when the Jesus and the disciples were keeping them every week. 
Um, again, that's when they were under the old covenant. I thought they were under the new covenant. Do you remember I, Jesus said... When, when he dies... He, is, he, is, he says it is finished mean? when he dies. Yeah. Okay, so when Jesus is keeping Sabbath in the Gospels, that's I'm prior talking about to, after he dies. So after he dies, is that when the new covenant starts? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, so when the new covenant starts uh, in, in, uh, when he dies, um, let's talk about that for a second, and I, I got a, a few more follow-up questions on that. Um, so in... Uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, when, it's, when Paul commands the converts to keep Passover uh, and that we'll be keeping the Sabbath in the millennium, how do you respond to Paul? When, is he putting his converts under bondage? Read the uh, text. Bondage? Read the text. In, in 1, John, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 5, 8, and he, and he says uh, to not, well, we'll just pull it up real quick here. It says, therefore, let us keep the feast of Passover, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So if we're going to keep Passover, according to one of the greatest apostles that ever lived, wouldn't by extension, because there are high Shabbats within Passover, he be also giving his instructions to his converts to keep the Sabbath? Yeah, I need to see the context on that. Do you mind if I take a second? You can, although uh, we don't have a second, and the context uh, is little value to a very direct uh, commandment of keep the feast. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll start at verse 6. Your boasting is not good. You do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Cleanse out the leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. So Christ is our Passover lamb. He has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven of the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right. He's, so not he saying, it... he's not saying here in this text that he's commanding the Corinthians to keep this, uh, the, the Pesach. That's so, not going so the on. word keep doesn't mean keep? Uh, not, not, again, he's speaking allegorically, unless you want to argue that the Corinthians are a bunch of leaven in a, whole, in a lump. Um, no, but they were, by default that he gives them instruction not to do it with, uh, with drunkenness and malice proves that they were already keeping the Passover, but they were doing it the wrong way. I so disagree he tells them with your reading of the text. So you're reading that into the text. Okay, I, I think the text is very clear, but let's go on because I only have one minute left. Chris, are you married? Yes. Uh, have you ever missed a birthday or an anniversary of your wife? Not that I remember. She would have beaten me if I did. So <laughs> my memory may be have lapsed. Okay. Well, listen, I know that I have. I will humble myself before you at least by uh, seven minutes, which is long enough to get in trouble. Uh, but let me just ask this. Uh, how much more, if a wife can get offended at missing an anniversary, how can we dare say that every day is alike on earth when God specifically gives us the, the, uh, in the pattern of the, of the marriage that every day is not alike, that there are special days, there are appointed times. So if women get offended and, and people can get offended for missing birthdays or anniversaries, how much more does the God of the universe be offended if we put aside what he says is special and holy? Well, I'm going to argue you're arguing philosophy in your own opinion. If you want to talk about a text, let's take a look at a text. Okay. Uh, so you agree that uh, there are special days, and those days should not be missed. Again, if you want to look at a particular text, I mean, I would point you to Romans 14 that says that one person considers all days alike and another... And we already established that was about fasting, Time. not about the Sabbath. Thank Time, you. gentlemen, stay right where you are. And we'll do a little role reversal here as Chris Roseboro gets to grill Jim Staley for 10 minutes. <laughs> Can we make it five? Yeah. <laughs> In the words of the venerable James Hook from the movie Hook, this is really going to hurt. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm joking. I just wanted to say that. No weapon formed against me shall stand. Jim, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, mm -hmm. verses 14 through, 15, uh, 14 through 15, it says, For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Yes, sir. What does that mean? Okay, well, if you look uh, at the first century and the term here that's, that is, is, uh, uh, is important to understand is the wall of separation. The reason why the apostle uses the wall of separation is because there was a very real wall of separation in the temple that was kept the Gentiles on this side of the wall and the Jewish people on that side of the wall. It was the wall of separation that was contained in ordinances and commandments that were not found in Torah 
but the oral law of the Jews that separated the Jew from the Gentile that was done away with. It was those laws of commandments as well as the sin and bonds of our sin that were nailed to the cross, not the law of God. If it is the law of God, we have big problems with Paul when he upholds the law, and John tells us to keep the commandments of God, and then in the Great Tribulation it's said that the saints are the ones that are keeping the commandments of God. What is the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to show people their sin and to prove our love for God. Okay. Do you keep it? I absolutely keep the best that I can. No questions asked. No more than I keep my wife's laws the best that I can. Okay. Is the standard set out in Scripture regarding the keeping of the Torah that you do your best, best that you can? What's the standard? The standard is perfection. There's no questions asked. Okay. So you because the standard is Christ, and we are to attain and reach for the standard of our Messiah. So you do not keep the Torah? I keep the Torah is, is as I absolutely best can, reaching for the rung of the Messiah. Do you appear three times a year before uh, the Lord in Jerusalem? Not required to. to. You're required to. Are you sure? If you're keeping Torah, you're required to appear before the Lord three times a year. Do you know where that scripture is? Yeah, yeah. it's actually, it, it, this is the, talking about the feast days. Okay, and, and do you know the conditions of which we're required to uh, appear before the Lord, and those conditions are not available today? So that commandment is put on pause because the requirement is that the temple if is there, supposed to be standing. If a temple was there, would you be keeping that? I suppose I would ask for him to give me a free flight status to get there, but... Uh, uh, absolutely, I would do my best to always honor my king. So you, if they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem... Which they will. Okay, then you're going to go, despite the fact that Jesus is the temple. I thought we were the temple. No, Jesus is the temple. Okay. Jesus he, says, tear down this temple and I will build it again in three days. Right. So you're going to, if they build a temple, you're going to observe Torah by traveling three times a year to Jerusalem. As when the temple is built, we will be in the millennium and we will already be in the Jerusalem area. So I don't think it'll be difficult for me to show up in my king's court and honor him. Okay, so we have an interesting eschatology. All right, question for you. Um, do you receive direct revelation from God? Sometimes. Okay. Um, are you a prophet? Uh, not in the role of prophet, but I believe in the gift of prophecy. Okay. Are you familiar with the fact that Daniel chapter 9 makes it very clear regarding that prophecy, regarding the Messiah that's fulfilled with the destruction of the temple, that along with it, the prophecy and vision are sealed up? Yes. Okay. Which prophecy is he talking about? Uh, it's Navi and Kazon. Both of them are sealed up. Mm-hmm. So, are you a prophet? I said, uh, in the role of prophet, no. As far as the gift of prophecy, if you're referring to the gift of prophecy as being completely rolled up and sealed up, then we have a giant problem when Paul tells us in Corinthians to seek prophecy, the gift, which okay. is greater than the gift of tongues. I saw a video of yours that you did not too long ago where you talked about a direct revelation that you had from God, at least that's you claim as the source, um, regarding the book of Romans. Do you consider your interpretation of Romans to be inspired by God the Holy Spirit? I believe that it's consistent with all the scriptures, which is the basis for understanding whether any revelation is of God. The scriptures tell us to base it against the actual standard of the written word of God. Any now, prophecy that comes outside or goes against the word of God, the Bible says, or if it doesn't come true, is a false prophecy. If I disagree with your interpretation of the book of Romans, am I sinning against Yahweh? It depends. If, you're, if your disagreement crosses the rest of scripture, then yes. Okay, but what if your interpretation actually is not consistent with what... Romans says. It would have to be shown, and tonight I don't believe that it, because a single contention has been addressed, I don't believe that that can be shown, but I am more than humble enough to say that if that uh, my contentions are found and proven to be false, uh, then yes, uh, then the inspiration that God gave me of understanding the book of Romans from a first century Hebraic mindset would be untrue. Okay. Colossians chapter 2, 13 says this, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The sentence says these are a shadow of things to come. What is the referent? If you go back in verse 8, you will see the context. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. So the context immediately tells us that he's not talking about the law of God whatsoever, that these are, these are uh, non-believers that are coming in with traditions and doctrines of men that have an appearance of religion but deny the power. So what's happening is that in verse 14 and 15 and 16 is that he's not saying, don't let them judge you for keeping the Shabbat. He's saying, don't let them judge you for the way that you are keeping the Sabbath because the way that you're keeping the Sabbath is not according to the rudiment 
principles of the doctrine of men, but it's according to Torah. And if you continue to read the, 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 the context, it makes it very clear uh, that who is talking here. It says, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those which has not been seen, vainly puffed up by the fleshly mind. He is giving us an absolute a definition of Jewish Gnosticism in the first century that believed in worshiping angels, cutting themselves. It is this sect of Judaism that is heretical that's trying to impose their beliefs on how you follow Torah, and Paul says, don't do it. We believe only in the Word of God, inspired by God, and, and keeping it according to the Spirit of Yeshua. Don't let them add or take away from the Word of so God. So let me see if I have this right. The, the reference to the sentence, these are a shadow of things to come, is referring to pagan practices. No. What was happening is that the first century circumcision party and many other sects of Judaism were taking the, the laws of God and they were taking the Shabbat and they were focusing on them for salvific purposes. That you had to be circumcised a certain way, you had to do this a certain way, or you were not saved. And the emphasis was always on the law for them to be accepted by God. Where Paul puts it in balance and says, no, it's a shadow. It's not done away with, but the shadow itself is pointing us to that which is more important. So don't let them judge you for the way you're keeping Sabbath because you have your priorities and your balance correct. You are focusing on the Messiah as you are keeping the Sabbath. If your interpretation is correct, correct why does Barnabas in his epistle actually argue that the Christians don't keep the Sabbath from the text that I read? How come, um, you know... Uh, you know, because just like we are sitting here in 2014 was no different in 110, in 150, or 200, or 300, is that the Gentiles don't understand Hebraic principles, idiomatic expressions, or the language itself because of anti-Semitism. They never sat and had a conversation with a Jew who understood the Scriptures from the perspective. Matter of fact, in the Epistle so of Barnabas, I think it's the Epistle of Barnabas that you even quoted, it has Jesus dying on Saturday and now, raising from the dead on Sunday. I want to point something That's how out far here. off So you're basically making the claim, and you made this earlier, that the church already regarding the Sabbath went apostate as early as the late first century. They misunderstood it, absolutely. No question about it. And if you look at history, we can go through history all the way through from, from the 700s, the 600s, even in 1492, with the expulsion from Spain of the Jews, the issue of the Spanish Inquisition was over the, spa the, the Sabbath so keeping the Gates Christians. of hell prevailed against the church, contrary to Christ's command, what he said. The, the question would be the definition of the true church. Um, so who's the true, true church then? Oh, the, the true church is those who accept Yeshua uh, as their personal Lord and Savior by faith, no doubt about it, but they prove that faith out, like James says, by doing what he said. Okay, so, so I'll leave the judgment up to God. So the church but this is This debate is gone through centuries. There were you say there are Christ, no Christians keeping the Sabbath. I can show you quote after quote after quote historically where there were thousands and thousands of Christians that were keeping the Sabbath. Even in the fifth century, Scholasticus says that all of the churches were keeping the Sabbath except for the churches in Rome and Alexandria. Am I apostate because I do not keep the Saturday Sabbath? I believe that if you do not keep any commandment of God that He actually meant what He said, that is a transgression against the law. Okay. Apostate know. is different than transgression against the law. And yet you made it clear that you thought the church was apostate on, on this, this issue. issue. From the beginning, basically the end of the first century, beginning of the uh, It's the even second. said in extra biblical writings that the apostle John was not even allowed in some of his churches by the end of the first century. That's how uh, he even says that the wolves were creeping into the church. At the end of the first century, they had lawlessness that was coming and being rampant in the church. And by the way, the word lawlessness is Torah-less-ness. Um, not if it's Greek, and if it's written in well, there's Greek. There's only one law, my friend, that's uh, the law of God. Actually, no, it's the law of Christ. Thank okay. We're, we're down to the wire now, with only uh, closing statements left. Okay, and i got to stay uh, up here, right? They are short at only five minutes each, and as Jim Staley began the debate tonight, um, he'll get the last word, and Chris Roseboro... Uh, go ahead and make your five-minute closing statement. Thank you. I'd like again to thank the po folks at uh, Passion for Truth and for Jim Staley and our uh, moderator tonight for allowing me to uh, participate in this debate. Now, as I've pointed out, when we take a look at what Scripture says and apply sound biblical hermeneutics, we see that the Mosaic Covenant has come to an end. Christians are no longer under, under that. And this is the reason why Christians from the late uh, first century on into the second century and forward 
did not observe the seventh-day Sabbath because they understood that Christ has fulfilled all of that. Now, as I've pointed out before from the book of Hebrews, that the Mosaic Covenant is type and shadow, and so is the Sabbath. Let's talk about the reality. And the reality is found for us in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about our true Sabbath rest. Here's what it says. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest, this is Christ, still stands. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit, benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed entered into that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So here's the idea. The shadow itself of the Sabbath would put to death anybody who worked on it. The reality, now that Christ has been revealed, that He's come and fulfilled the law for us, the reality that the Sabbath pointed to was salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, by what Christ has done. When we are in Christ, we have entered into the true Sabbath rest. And to add works to what Christ has already done by giving us that rest is to make yourself outside of what God has done for you. So the Sabbath itself would put to death anybody who worked on it. Salvation by grace alone says if you add any works to what Christ has done in your salvation, which is a free gift, which is a gift from God and is our true Sabbath rest, then you're not truly in Him and you will experience eternal death. This is about rightly understanding what God's Word says regarding the Sabbath. I hope that I've been able to provide a good challenge for you all and I would recommend that you don't take my word for it. Never listen to anybody with an open mind. Always listen with an open Bible. Thank you. Jim, were you counting on the last minute to prepare your closing statement, or are you, are you ready? <laughs> I, too, want to thank uh, everyone here at Passion for Truth, including the senior pastor, for allowing me to come and be a part of this. Now listen, for those that believe that God meant what He said, when He told us to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy in the garden before man sinned, we are in a win-win situation because there's not a single commandment that mandates believer keep the Sunday, nor is there a single commandment obliterating the Sabbath. Nor is there any proof anywhere in the Bible that God changed His mind about a day that He set apart and calls holy. As I talked about in my opening statement and I gave my contentions, my opponent has not answered any of my contentions that I gave of explaining why did God give the Sabbath day in the, on the seventh day in creation before man sinned and why did he call it holy? And then why did Jesus say that it was made for man? And he says that, if, that the, the law says that if man commits, uh, breaks the Sabbath that he shall be uh, killed. That's absolutely true. Ladies and gentlemen, for all of us have fallen short of glory of God and the wages of sin is death. He's right. The difference is, is that our Lord sent the Messiah to die to pay the penalty for us breaking the Sabbath, not so that we don't ever stop keeping it again. Like Paul says, shall we continue to sin because faith came? Never may it be. A day that was set aside before man sinned, a day that was called the seal of his people, a day that Jesus and disciples kept, all the Christians kept outside of Rome, and the day that we will be mandated when he comes back. There's no commandment telling us to stop keeping the Sabbath, only assumptions from misunderstood text, quotes from anti-Semitic church fathers that were looking for any way to distance themselves from the Jews. So 
Chris, if you are right and I'm wrong, I lose nothing. Absolutely nothing. But if, you, if you're wrong and I'm right, you will have to answer to God why you choose to follow the church fathers who hated the Jews instead of the father of the church who is the son and his son was Jewish. Isaiah 58, 13 says, If you keep your feet from breaking the Shabbat and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way, then I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and the feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. At the end of the day, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've celebrated Sunday as a Sabbath for 30 years of my life. The last 10 years, I've chosen to return to the Christian roots of my faith. And all I can tell you is that I can personally tell you that following God at His Word in both spirit and truth has radically changed me as a person. It's radically changed my marriage and my family. It's truly a delight to come together every Friday evening as a family and bless my children. As you'll see from the slides that they'll put, that they'll, they'll put up on, the, on the, the, the PowerPoint, and as they move through the slides, you'll begin to see that the, the Sabbath is a blessing. I get a chance to bless my children and my wife every single week. I get a chance to explain to them what the lechem, the bread is, the life of, of Yeshua Himself, the wine, His blood, and the fruitfulness thereof, the candles and the light, and explain the light each and every week. To take away the Sabbath from God's people and to call it bondage is one of the most heretical statements I've ever had myself, which now, on the other side, am embarrassed of. Solomon said at the end of his life this, this is the end of the matter. All have been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Every one of us have two choices of who you're going to follow. You can choose to follow the church fathers if you'd like. But for me and my house, we will follow the father of the church. Thank you. Thank you very much. Both our participants were phenomenal tonight, especially in terms of playing by the rules and... Great job, yeah, you too. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight, for watching on television, and I know it was a blessing for everybody who listened because uh, there was a lot of great information shared. And uh, as I said, this was a historic night uh, tonight, and it's probably the first of many debates like this we'll see, but because it's the first, you know, you might want to get these guys autographs tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. God bless.